Hey everyone, Rob Rothoff here, and excited to kick off a, really the start of a series of, I think it's about we have 14 different courses here in this theological track. And the name theological, and we'll explain in a second, but uh, really it kind of comes from this idea of looking at religion, theology, understanding, bringing in world history from a logical point of view. Um, my background is very much in uh, steeped in software development, uh, taxonomy, ontology, really um, from a technical side of things is how I look at things and everything has to be classified. I need things to make sense. And so ultimately I started off um, about maybe about five years ago now deciding that I was going to rethink thinking. I was going to um, really throw away everything that I was raised with, everything that I had learned over the years and just say, look, if they're, you know, if what I believe is truth, then I'll come back to this. Um, I found later, and I ended up writing a book, Theological, um, and I found later that it was maybe a dangerous exercise that I don't think I would have maybe wanted to do again, um, but I'm happy that I went through it um, out the other side. Ultimately, the, the book itself um, is written fr from an agnostic point of view. Um, but uh, this course is admittedly, uh, you know, has a, 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 a Christian bias. And not Christian in the sense of um, standardized Christian religion, because you'll find in, even in this course here how I, I tear down what many think Christianity is. Um, but what I do come out of this, you know, believing, and this is a, really a continuation from um, my course Pattern Matching Existence where, um, and if you haven't taken that, I recommend you do so. And this is where I just kind of analyze the objective reality that I'm uh, facing and understanding that, you know, we'll talk about objective versus subjective in a second, but understanding this idea of what can I prove, what is objective and what is subjective, um, how, what can I learn from nature, what can I learn from really just existence that, you know, is true um, and, and, and can never be proven untrue to me. Um, from there, that kind of brought me down this path. And so ultimately, this is a series of, of courses that are um, based around the, the um, alignment around um, Christian apologetics. <clears throat> but how I got here was from an ag agnostic and to, at a point in time, atheistic uh, mindset. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, this will be biased, um, but if you read my book, Theology, which this is based on, um, that was an unbiased approach to finding what is real. It's just hard for me now to um, ultimately pretend that I don't know what I don't know. And so, again, with this, I'll try and, and you know, revisit my book in an objective way, um, but I just want to be upfront with my bias because I think too often people are not... Um, I guess ultimately honest with with the lens that they wear. So with this, we're going to cover a few different topics. One is um, you know really uh, speaking about analyzing religion as a science, and this is going to be gathering theological data, categorizing it, um, discussing various different beliefs in a higher power, and really analyzing uh, really current you know religions and tracing religions back to their origins, um, as well as you know kind of maybe poking a little bit at what are you know religions based on and you know which artifacts are um, you know make sense or not I guess from a, from a, from my perspective of what I see as, as, as logical so again this whole course is really just a view through my lens um, however if you did read my book or uh, previous courses you'll see that I really have tried to clear my lens and clean it as much as possible to uh, ultimately get to a point of objective truth now <clears throat> Excuse me. Before you know, even bothering researching facts, like we have to come to terms with this idea that, as much of the information that we believe is objective, we still have to understand that we are still seeing things through a subjective lens. And so, um, you know, this is kind of a continuation of the course, uh, rethinking thinking, where um, I wanted to figure out, like, really, how do we start? You know, cleaning that lens of subjectivity and seeing things that are objective. So, in um, page 34 of my book, I write, 
we should be familiar with the concept of how we see the world through a series of lenses. Each lens comes with varying degrees of thickness, uh, so to speak, which alter how we view the world. Lenses are based on what we observe as a child. A lens may come from trauma, it may come from beliefs of what we accept, from political views that we adopt, values we place on tangible or intangible things. If we remove all of our lenses and we share the exact same lens, then we all exist in the same objective reality. However, this is not the case with most as we exist in a subjective reality and ultimately uh, what I believe is inside of an objective reality. So what this means is, is um, you know, we ultimately have to acknowledge that we still don't understand everything. And I think anybody that says they do understand anything is uh, ignorant. Um, but what I am hoping to do here is present enough viewpoints and enough facts that we're able to start seeing through our subjective lens into an objective reality. Now, some may disagree, you know, right now with me with the concept that there even can be an objective reality. And we can argue over, you know, Wigner's friends implications on quantum states or theorize that existence is subjective through modal realism, which although is possible in a multi you know, universe theory kind of environment is highly unprobable and ultimately, I believe, driven by a nihilist viewpoint. So, you know, our friend Occam's razor would suggest that objective, that reality is objective and that there is not a multi-universe theory. Um, objective, you know, Occam's razor would suggest that what we see is what exists. And so, again, you know, you may not agree that there's an objective truth, but even if you say that objective truth does not exist, I mean, that statement alone would disprove itself, right? The statement would require there to be an objective truth for you to say there is not an objective truth. So ultimately, you know, I think for this exercise, let's explore what it would look like to understand objective truth. And, you know, I think the way that I would maybe describe this or, or, or the the way that I think that I came across to understanding objective truth was, let's say that there's a, a red flag, okay? And if I show this, I'd raise this red flag up and I show it to everybody in the room, and then we say, can we agree on the color of this, right? And everyone's gonna say, well, you know, it's, it's red, right? Understanding that there's implications of, you know, a lot of other things, including including groupthink and others, right? But I think a few people would say, well, I, th I see it more of a pinkish gray, um, and other people are going to maybe not speak up at all because they've been told that their perception is warped, right, and that they're colorblind, right? And so, again, you know, they feel that they can't trust their, um, their subjective lens. Um, others who may not be told that they see things differently and reject authority may speak out, right, and say the flag is actually pink, Right? Who's to say what's red anyways? You know, and this, and this is that narrative. And I feel like this concept is applied to theology. This concept of we don't really know what's objective. And um, I think th there can be an argument made that while some things are unprovable, what I want to focus on is the things that are provable. And so for those that say, you know, what really is red? I mean, red is just a state of mind, right? Um, you know, I think we can disagree because we can not, let's not forget that ultimately color is wavelengths, right? So, so the color that we perceive is just a, um, you know, a wavelength of light that we're interpreting as color. So the only constant is not this is red, right? But the constant of an objective reality would be the wavelength of that frequency, right? So the objective reality is there is a majority of us are, uh, would agree that red is a wavelength of interval of approximately 700 nanometers, right? Or a frequency around 430 terahertz. This is not subjective. This is a scientifically agreed upon fact, right? So we may call things, you know, that frequency something different, but we're all seeing the same frequency. And, and I think that that is ultimately, um, for me, how I describe objectivity is while our lens may vary and way I may see something that I would consider red, you may see something you see as pinkish gray, we have to acknowledge that there's an objective frequency, meaning that there's an objective truth that we subjectively are interpreting as the color that we see.
right? And so for me, if we understand that there is a God, right, God would be that constant that provides that basis of objective truth, right? He would be the frequency, so to speak, that sets what is true. Now, you can believe what you want to about what God is, but we should be able to agree on the idea that uh, whatever viewpoint of God is, there's an objective truth would, you know, would be ultimately from their perspective, right? So, so God's viewpoint would be the objective truth. Now, there's nuances again. You could say, well, we live in a multiverse uh, where, you know, there is nothing objective. Every multiverse has their own objective reality. Okay, that's um, an argument that you could make. Um, you could also say that we live in a polytheistic world and that there are multiple gods and every god has its own reality. That one is a stretch because um, inside of this reality, there is a series of frequencies. There's a series of rules. There's a series, you know, mathematics. Mathematics is a constant um, that in a polytheistic environment ultimately falls apart, right? We see that there are not conflicting energy sources. There is one frequency. There is one set of mathematical rules, right? Everything in nature that we see in this universe is consistent with there being a singular um, power, a singular source of truth. So if you want to believe in multi-universe theory, then you could actually, I believe, make a case to say that um, there are multiple realities, but you can only live in one universe at a time. So based on the universe that you are currently um, subject to, you are in an objective set of reality, an objective set of rules for the multiverse that you live in. So even if you were to argue there's a multiverse, the, it, it, doesn't, it, it, it falls flat because you are subject to the, the multiverse that you are inside of the universe that you're inside of. So ultimately what I'm getting at is, is that from a logical perspective, there's no way that I can see um, anything other than there being an objective truth just by looking at nature, by understanding mathematics, by understanding really the um, all that goes into our existence all speaks to a unified energy source. And I don't say that from a spiritualistic point of view, but I say that from an idea that um, I cannot see um, a polytheistic, um, I guess I can't make, there's, there's no argument that I've been able to, and I've, I've been really on a seeking truth here. I'm not trying to push one viewpoint. Well, now I am, now that I feel that I've, I've kind of um, locked in, I've settled into truth, uh, what I believe is an objective truth. But ultimately what I'm getting at here is, um, you know, I believe that there is a single source, and that then forms the objective truth. Now, I don't want to belabor this anymore, but Ultimately, what I think is interesting is if we do not believe that God sets this objective truth, we are in that very statement then setting ourselves as God. Right? There's no logical case, again, that I can imagine that there is no God um, and also an objective, or that there is, an obj there is a God and no objective truth, right? So at least not in a monotheistic or henotheistic viewpoint. Now, again, I question if our desire for independence opinions or our, our need to plant a flag of subjective truth is ultimately an establishment of our own subjective truth as a way to elevate ourselves and diminish our value in God, which is the objective truth. And I do believe that uh, God has created um, you know, free will and free will allows for subjectivity. If we analyze our beliefs in a logical way, we may find that they simply do not mix together. And that's the problem, is that the more we start looking through a subjective lens in a logical way, we may actually find that our belief structures actually clash uh, with what we actually believe. And so it may you know, make more sense in some instances for you know, us to invent a whole new religion with ourselves as God than it does to merge multiple existing narratives together to make a hybrid. Um, anyway, so again, um, there's a lot of implications around clinging to subjectivity, clinging to um, this idea of, you know, I will invent my own pathway to God, um, because ultimately, if we take a step back, we'll realize that there are some very important, uh, I guess, consequences and implications uh, to what religion that we choose. One could say, implications of eternal life or eternal death, um, but more than just impacting your life,
by backing some religion, which honestly, free will, I believe that free will gives us, God gave us the, the ability to say, I'll believe anything I want. And I think you are able to. The problem, um, and that's your life, you have that life to live. The problem is, is that there are implications that by backing a certain religion or by holding different viewpoints, you're actually oppressing another person's free will. And we've seen this through um, most, exactly, uh, most instances um, of uh, religious domination. We, we saw this with the Catholic Church and how the Dark Ages ensued after the Catholic Church tried to oppress their form of Christianity on the world. And so, again, it's really important that while I believe that you have the ability to choose and believe anything you want, if you then take your free will and your subjective lens and then start imposing that on others, um, I believe that's um, in incredibly not only just dangerous for yourself, but dangerous to society. I think we, if we can accept that there's an objective viewpoint, um, I think it'll be self-evident that we would really take the time to research and discover what is true, right? For me, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that claim that, you know, they're one religion or another, right? And and I, and I probe them a little bit and ask them, oh, when did you, you know, start believing this? And they say, well, that was, that was the religion I was born into, right? And we find out that m many of us, including myself uh, in my early days, never took the time to study really any religion for themselves. Then they just adopted it. They just say, well, I was raised in this faith. Um, you know, my friends are this. You know, my, the church that I've been sent to is this. The school I was sent to is this. And just because we may consider ourselves to be one particular religion doesn't mean that we actually even understand what that religion believes in. And I think more dangerously, we may fi actually find out that we are holding on to beliefs of many different religions unknowingly. And this is more common when we, when we realize that the various different world, re world religions have kind of snuck in and altered our perception of life, who God is, our purpose, and general existence, right? I think it's, it's dangerous that we have allowed uh, through media and through um, just, um, a, was it compromise or a, a desire to, for disharmony and getting along to kind of allow little things to sneak in where we may believe that we have you know power in ourselves to achieve a higher state of being or we can manifest our desires or which come from like a trans theistic viewpoint you know taught ultimately in kind of buddhism and, and um, jainism before buddhism um, but we may also believe that you know god had created you know the evolutionary process but did not literally create the earth in three in, in six days right and that's as atheistic evolutionary or you know dark, uh, you know deism would imply um we may go to church on sunday because that's what protestants who came out of the catholic church have always done despite a clear statement in the bible of the seventh day sabbath right we may be keeping traditions of man rather than traditions of god we may be ultimately um you know, maybe keeping traditions that God gave us that pointed forward to Jesus' return that are now obsolete. I mean, the list goes on. What I want us to kind of understand is this concept of, you know, syncriticism. Uh, and I probably misspelled, uh, misspoke that, but uh, synchris, syncriticism. Yeah, anyway, I can't speak this morning. But what that is, is it's a combination of different beliefs, right, blended together as different schools of thought. And ultimately, you know, an example of this is this merging between mythology and theology, right? And this is what we saw under Constantine when Constantine merged uh, ultimately pagan Rome with Christianity to form papal Rome. It was this uh, hybrid, and it's been ultimately because uh, Catholicism had dominated the world uh, for such a period of time, that now is rooted into many of the religions that have now come out of Catholicism and pulling out and throwing away, discarding, you know, uh, uh, untruths as part of the Protestant Reformation. Um, but ultimately, what I'm getting at is there's, um, you know, this is how there are people that say they're Christians, which believe in evolution. And <clears throat> I believe you can either think that the Bible is a nice book or a literally inspired word of God, okay? Another example is believing in an intelligent design by a creator or some random string of events as part of the, the you know, theory of evolution, right? You can wish to believe in the theory of evolution um, or in a creator God, and that's your choice. Both comes from free will. But if someone says they believe in both a creator God and also that we evolved from monkeys, it breaks both narratives. And this is the, again, 
um, you know, the danger of learning about different religions and holding on to little teeny parts that appeal to us, and we start kind of collecting together, um, you know, different aspects of different religions and stirring them in in our big pot of, of of belief, right? Belief soup, right? Or subjective stew, as you would, right? And I think it's important that we understand what we've put into our brain, what is in our subjective stew, and figure out, you know, should we be able to analyze these and maybe start. Um, figuring out if any of these viewpoints that have crept in over time actually are contradictory. And so that's kind of really the what I wanted to, I guess, speak to is an idea of analyzing what we believe, right? And, and I believe that, you know, there, some thought work, if you wanted to go through an exercise, would be really to start and think about, okay, what are my non-negotiables first? Like, like really, you know, Ignore the uh, the dogma, ignore kind of the doctrinal aspect right now, and really go deep down and say, you know, what is true to me? What is my core beliefs? And write those down. For me, this helps start to lead um, you know, and guide you. And, and, and if you believe that there is an objective truth, if you believe there is a God, pray that, that, you know, that God will lead you and to understanding uh, more clearly. And so for me, you know, it's, you know, nature, biology, geometry, you know, mathematics, it's it's way too perfect to be random. I have a whole course um, just around uh, pattern matching existence where I, I explain this stuff and it's just like, it becomes so obvious to me that there has to be an intelligent designer, right? So now that means that because I believe there's an intelligent designer, um, one of my core desires is to seek out who this creator is. And I've experienced too many prayers, too many answers to prayers um, for God to be chance. And so there must be an active, present, um, you know, loving God who cares about my concerns. That is what I hold as true. Those are my fundamental beliefs. And those are beliefs that are not, you know, given to me by someone else. Those are beliefs that is, I have looked at nature and biology and geometry and mathematics. I have, you know, asked for prayers to be answered and, and have seen in powerful ways prayers being answered to the point where there's no question for me, um, you know, these core beliefs. And so from there, what I recommend we do is then take from our core beliefs and say, now let me analyze the doctrines. Let me analyze, you know, are there anything that maybe actually conflict with this core belief? And this is going to help us to cleanse our, our subjective lens and start seeing things, hopefully, in a, in a more objective way. So that's a recap of really you know, thinking, you know, is there an objective truth? Is there a subjective truth? With this recap, um, ultimately, what I hope is that we start just thinking for ourselves um, but more than that, thinking about if there is something truer than ourselves. And so I just um, leave you with that thought. And i hoping that you'll join me on this series um, where we just really explore um, theology in a logical way. All right. Thanks so much.